so we we are also to we are also able to uh, plug and unplug. Yeah, yeah. No. Takes a while. No. Okay. Okay. That's it. Thanks. Uh, so thanks. So uh, here uh, we just rescale the plots just to. to but by the SDRG prediction to show that we go actually go to the SDRG prediction of for the gap at large modulation, and we can also try to uh, do a finite size scaling of the of the gap plots and get a beautiful scaling with with uh, the predicted value of the of the transition the modulation for the transition, and with a dynamical exponent equal to one and the new exponent equal to two. So. Uh, this leads us to believe that this whole phase here is many body localized, and we also uh, did SDRG calculations uh, outside the Heisenberg limits and obtained uh, the result that there is a minimum value of the anisotropy in order to produce uh, this aperiodic dimer many body localized phase separated from the extended Lutchinger liquid phase. Uh, but it and it's important to tell that that uh, the non-interacting case here is, uh, is extended even for strong disorder. Even if you, if, even if you take st very, str very strong modulation, uh, you don't get the many-body localized phase unless you add interactions. Uh, so uh, that's it. Pre uh, uh, this only summarized what, what I just said. And we have to thank the financial support of Brazilian agencies. Thank you very much for your attention. Very good. We have plenty of time for questions. Uh, but 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 the low energy Hamiltonian is is interacting to begin with, uh, okay? Uh. Oh, in a sense, any many body localized phase, you you can you can diagonalize and express as as some kind of Occupation number, uh, in, in the sense, are they always single particle excitations? I, I don't know. Okay. Uh, I think I think we have to we would have to to look at the numerical results for the dynamics, but it okay. Uh, well, I, I would say there are residual interactions. This yes. is this is a picture, a heuristic picture, yes. but but the singlets actually do interact. Yes. Right? Yes, these are just, just by perturbation theory. Yes. You ignore those things. Yes, I'm not sure that's the case here, but I'm just thinking okay, to myself. No, you, you you have to have corrections to the, the perturbation theory all the time. So, yeah, yeah. Gabe. I'm sorry. Uh,
okay. I I I I don't know how. To, I don't know. I don't know. We we haven't we haven't looked. State. How does the state progress? I mean, have you calculated things like entanglement entropy? And yeah. And yeah. And no, and okay. Yeah. That that's uh, that that would be in the outlook. We have to numerically check that with some time-dependent methods. I uh, mean, you have shown that this is completely correct. Okay. Right? Yeah. 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 No. But but of course, of course, we have to check dynamics. Yes. Uh, explicitly in the uh, without any perturbation theory and based on, uh, for instance, look at the middle of the. Gapped uh, of the yeah. gapped uh, yeah. fate. Okay, but but you haven't done that yet. So I, can I ask one more? Yeah. So th just another uh, slightly um, uh, trivial question. In the case of the marginal disorder, you'd still do this SDRG process. Yes. A weak disorder. You do this. Uh, is it really uh, valid to do this? SDRG? No, no. I mean, I mean, uh, no. I, I start with, I start with uh, weak disorder uh, with strong disorder. Ah, okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. And and then then I can check yeah, that. Fine. Okay. Uh, just a quick question: When, when you uh, have your triplon Hamiltonian, uh, the disorder that you have is deterministic still, or, or it's deterministic? Okay. Okay. Uh, but the phase in the end is, is, a, is a is a random singlet phase in uh, it's for the no, triplons, right? Not. Uh, n Yes, ki kind of, for the effective interaction, yes. It, it, it's just a Henderson, uh, 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 something similar to an Anderson Hamiltonian, with, but, but with random hoppings. Right, right. Yeah. But I mean, the exponent is the same as random singlet yes. and so on. Okay, okay so uh, let's move on to the next. Uh, let, well, let's first thank. So, you know, uh, uh, just a short question for me. Uh, the, the, the in, in quasi crystals, uh, the states are not exactly like metallic states, but they are some sort of multifractal states. It is known that when you put weak disorder, you actually make them more metallic as opposed to less metallic, and they talk about the inverse Mathiasen's rule. Uh, is there anything to be said about uh, this issue from your perspective and from SDRG? Well, certainly the system gets more metallic uh, with weaker if, if you have this, this kind of weakly uh, irrelevant, uh, but then when you... More metallic? I mean, he's, he's saying, I think, no, on, on top of the no, AP of this city, if you add a little bit of disorder on right, top... Yeah, if you add a bit, no, but, but, then, but then what happens is uh, whatever thing that you put in which fluctuates the most will win in the end. So if you put randomness in t on top of that, the randomness, uh, the geometrical fluctuations associated with randomness are stronger. Yes, but there is a transient, there could be a very transient, yeah. which, would, which would show this behavior. Yeah, that, that would be interesting. Okay. okay, let's move on now. Work? The okay. sound works, the image works, doesn't. Okay. 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 I think this one. Yeah. It, something has happened. Okay. Yeah, it, it, will, it takes a while. It takes yeah, a while. It takes a while. There you go. So, um, is that the talk? That's my talk. Uh, so <laughs> so l I was going to introduce you, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> I'm Let me try here. Since I, I was hoping for a title, but since it doesn't have one, I, I'm going to do it here. No, let me do it. <laughs> so I, I'm, 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 I'm very glad that I'm the chair, because I'm probably one of the few people here 
who can pronounce his name. So now we're going to have Vlad Dobrosavljevic talking about approaching disorder-driven metal insulator transitions in the formable lattices, the mystery of MUI correlations. Yes, uh, so uh, let me just first say uh, I'm, I was a little bit involved in organizing this, but in fact my, my contribution was minimal. I'm really grateful to Jose and, for, and, to, uh, uh, and to Eric for bringing us here, which I'm really enjoying very much every moment of it. Uh, this work is in fact uh, mostly with my collaborators here in Grenoble. This is why there is this picture. This is uh, Sean Bruce, where I grew up as a kid and I came back 40 years later to find these wonderful collaborators uh, and we discovered uh, much of mutual, much of mutual interest. Uh, so today I will show you some results that we have on this whole problem of metal disorder-driven metal insular transitions uh, uh, are motivated by some uh, experiments done over the long period of time. Uh, so this is work done in collaboration with Simone Fratini at Grenoble and his long-term collaborator Sergio Cucci who, uh, oh maybe this, how does this work? Does it work? <laughs> Here, okay. All right, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay. Yeah, no, don't worry, I, I, it's fine. So Sergio Cucci is uh, Simone's long-term collaborator who is an expert on polarons and his post former postdoc, Domenico De Santi. So, and also I should of course say, I'm very grateful for, from, to NSF for not dumping me uh, yet. Um, so, as we heard many times uh, in this workshop, uh, one of the big uh, problems in physics is the metal insular transition, and that's a difficult problem because uh, there are various things that could uh, stop the electrons from moving, and people have looked at different mechanisms as independent from each other. There's a lot of beautiful work done on the effect of disorder in non interacting systems, so called causation. But uh, it has, there's a lot of reason to believe that this kind of picture is very incomplete, and in fact, as I will try to com uh, convince you today, perhaps maybe even completely irrelevant. Uh, but what you do, you, you generally uh, just crank up disorder and the metal can be destroyed at some point. Then uh, in between you have some uh, region where you know, the system doesn't, it's not necessarily described even as a good metal or as a good insulator. And it's a zero temperature transition only because at fine temperature all materials conduct to some extent. So, uh, you can say that this is a quantum critical point and then there is a region associated with this transition and you may wonder how, you know, when you approach this transition, what in fact happens. Uh, so this has been a, a, a difficult problem and in fact, despite the fact that the metal and solar transition is the one of the uh, basic problems in solid state physics, uh, still uh, not totally not understood at this moment. Um, so, as I mentioned, uh, Phil Anderson, of course, uh, one of the first people to point out that uh, when disorder is strong enough, you can form bound states and an insulator, even if you don't have open any gaps. But Mott said that, uh, you know, if you turn on interactions of some kind, uh, then the interactions can accomplish the same thing. When you put the two together, it, it has been a lot of controversy whether the two mechanisms help each other or hurt each other, and that may depend on the system. So there's a lot of confusion in this field. What happens when you have these two mechanisms together? In fact, relatively little is known. Uh, a lot of studies that have been done in the past have been based on perturbing the metal weakly uh, with weak disorder near two dimensions. And uh, even though the formalism that was developed in this process is rather beautiful and based on the matrix sigma model and so forth, uh, many of us worked on this as, as, as young kids. Uh, this approach has been remarkably unsuccessful to describe any experiments. And, um, <coughs> but, you know, the first thing that you remember from college, so to speak, uh, what happens when you start putting weak disorder in metals? Well, uh, in metals you have uh, phonons and uh, most of the temperature dependence is linear around room temperature comes from scattering of these phonons. When you put weak disorder, what happens is that uh, at, low, at zero temperature the resistivity becomes finite, the conductivity uh, also is finite. So, and then uh, basically uh, there is this so-called Matthiasen's rule that says that when the scattering events are weak of any kind, they simply add up either you scatter off one or the other, and that will tell you that uh, uh, in addition to making the resistivity finite at low temperature, this whole curve will be shifted up like this, and this is indeed observed in a weak disorder within the Druder regime in ma many metals, and this is uh, you know, an accepted view of what happens 
uh, in metals, uh, you run the room temperature regime. I'm not talking about the super low temperatures where there are some high order weak localization terms. But uh, if you actually look at the literature and ask, well, what happens when you make the disorder stronger and stronger, then you find that this simple uh, rule, which works so well for good metals, it starts to break down in pretty bad ways. And this review article was written when I was a graduate student in around 85. Uh, Lee and Ramakrishnan summarized what was known at that point. They studied systematically the effects of weak disorder on metals, and they described all the theory behind weak localization interaction, all these quantum, so-called quantum corrections. And at the end of this review article, they say, well, listed some open problems which they could not describe or understand, address at the time. And one of them was uh, section number 7A, uh, open problems, high temperature anomalies was the first one on the list in the open problem section. And so what they pointed out, this is a classic experiment by Dines, Rowell, and Schmidt in 1981, where they took a, a, a good metal. This, these are actually some of the A15 compounds, but as you will see, there are many more materials showing this. Uh, there's a metal, and if you go up to room temperatures, here's the linear resistivity. This is, of course, phonons. Um, it's linear above the Debye temperature. At low temperature, is a little bit different. But, but if you focus on this high temperature regime, you find that when the disorder is weak, uh, then you shift these curves up, as Matthiasen said. But they were able to make the disorder, uh, uh, to increase it in a controlled way by, uh, by irradiating by high X-rays or ions, bombarding the system and gradually tuning the disorder up. And when you do this, you see that actually not only these curves are shifting up, but the slope decreases. And at then at some, there is a magical point where the slope vanishes here. And that coincides amazingly with Mott, what Mott predicted. Mott said that the mean-free path, which is the main object in Drude theory, when it becomes uh, comparable to lattice spacing, then we cannot go further in the metal, and then something has to happen. Mott suggested that the, uh, the conductivity should drop to zero in a first-order fashion. Later, when the scaling theory localization, etc., came forward, it became clear this is not exactly correct, but this uh, Mott limit served as a demarcation line between a good metal conductor with the transport and scattering picture and something else. And of course, at stronger disorder, you have an insulator, but all these curves here as you can see, they are not insulating. They, are, they have an inverse slope, they have a negative slope, and they go to find a value. If you go to stronger disorder, eventually you will get uh, exponentially raising resistivity. And, uh, but there isn't this intermediate regime which has been mysterious. Now, I want to ex emphasize that this regime is not the regime near the metal insular transition, not too close, because, uh, for example, in scaling theories, you are describing curves that are the resistivity is going up, but to a finite value, and that the, this finite value diverges, and you have a family of curves that you can scale, but all curves are going up, right? When the curves are not going up like this, this is the outside of this critical regime. So uh, this is not necessarily even within excess of what you may think about scale theory, because uh, you know this is obviously not this is something where where probably the that you want to associate with the metal and sweat transition or any quantum phase transition is not necessarily very long. So you may say, well, maybe this is some, something that doesn't happen very often. Maybe it's just some weird and complicated behavior. By the way, for those who are interested in phosphorus doped silicon, Gabe Bapley gave us a beautiful talk saying that soon maybe we'll be able to go back to this problem. This has been part of the problem that uh, when you look at phosphorus doped silicon, you see something similar to this. And this happens about density 10% transition. So uh, people have tried to use scaling theory to understand it, but you cannot scale the data when, they, when the slope change is tight. This is impossible. So this is part of the mystery. You know, how do we understand this regime where something happens? Now you may say maybe it's just complicated, not universal. What uh, Mui uh, in, in the 70s uh, pointed out is that in this regime, there's a rather systematic behavior. He said that resistivity in this high temperature regime uh, is a linear function of temperature, but the slope changes sign and exactly vanishes here around the Mott limit. But, uh, but the slope and the intercept are correlated in such a way that if you actually extrapolated linearly these curves, they will all cut at one point. So this is called a Mui correlation, and it has been found in initially in some materials. Uh, it's shown here. Here is this uh, prefactor a linear coefficient, and here is the residual resistivity. You see that there is a linear behavior, and these are blue are the data uh, uh, 
from the from uh, the, the red are the data from this paper, and uh, the blue is the theory that I will describe in a minute. So this has been a long-standing puzzle. What is happening here, and is this something that you know you can relate to the approach of transition? Something completely different. Is it related to anisole causation? Is it related to something completely different? Well, the first reaction is that well, you know, here you know this temperature dependent comes from phonons. We know this very well, and then just the slope change in sign. So it has something to do with phonons, and it has something to do with disorder. Uh, these kind of systems where this is seen, they are not uh, strongly correlated materials of the mod type. This is far from the mod transition. Probably electron-electron interactions are not very important here, and there are broad classes of materials in this in this class. In fact, I want to show you that uh, here is Mui, a good-looking guy, and uh, this is the list of materials that this has this uh, this phenomenology has been observed. See, there are probably more than 500 materials over the years which display this pretty universal behavior around the MOT limit. Now, of course, many of you know that the MOT limit is a, is a, is a concept that has a big question mark that has been, been brought to, to, uh, to uh, attention by Kivelson and many others in the context of high TC, because once you cross the MOT limit, then your normal picture of metallic transport doesn't make much sense. But the question is then, what do you do to answer those questions? And uh, the first hint of what could be important was, uh, was put forward by none others than our favorite hero, Mr. Anderson, here in 1972, uh, who pointed out that if you form bounds, then something has to happen which is not happening in metals. In metals, the electron is zooming around, and the lattice deformations don't do much because the electron is fast and the phonons are slow. But once you form a bound state, then the lattice will accommodate this to lower it's ended to lower the energy of the bound state and to dig a potential well. So this is, uh, he had a uh, language for this, it's called the Frank Condon principle, but uh, basically he said that you see when you, if you turn on the, if you have bound states like this uh, due to disorder, you turn on electron phonon coupling, those that are occupied will come down and the other ones won't. And the net result of this is that you will tend to open a gap. This is what Anderson said. And it's very easy to show if you have very strong binding in any model of electron phonon coupling, you'll see that this will immediately happen. Now, what Anderson did not tell us is how does this phenomenon happen as you approach the transition? Does it affect the transition? And in particular, does it affect this murky metallic regime before the transition happens around the MOT limit? That's, he didn't tell us, but this is a hint that phonons and polaronic effects should be important. So now, uh, I just want to say a couple of words why this problem is so difficult, and this has been the motivation of my life, uh, because uh, in statistical mechanics, when you talk about phase transitions, uh, we learned in school that Landau told us that we can introduce another parameter. And this is a beautiful approach and has been very successful for many phase transitions, but not for this kind of transition, because we don't hear, we don't have a symmetry difference between the two states. They are a fewer, fewer examples of systems where you do not change the symmetry between the metal and the insulator, but there are, as you've seen, a list of materials where this happens. And then you don't have at your disposal the luxury of using the tricks from, uh, from Lando. And then, but you know, in the old days also Anderson said that, well, talking about disorder effects, the orthodox phase transition theory will be of little help to us for the time being, and thus the great body of literature in the field is simply irrelevant. So this became clear very early on, and uh, it, but you know, this didn't help much in, in, in shedding light. Uh, some ideas how this could be done, at least in the simplest way, been, have been developed by, uh, by my former postdoctoral advisor, Mr. Kotliar, in the uh, late 90s when High TC era came about. But uh, I should say that, you know, Gabi was a student of Phil, and Phil, his whole life, he pushed forward the idea that in, to complement the block view where we think about momentum states uh, for good metals as we approach the insulator, because the momentum and the coordinate cannot be both satisfied as good quantum numbers, as we learned from Mr. Heisenberg, uh, then the local view uh, offers an alternative perspective, and for many practical purposes, the local perspective should be favored uh, as we approach the insulating state. So this was the overarching uh, idea of, of, of Anderson, and I think Gabi took this very seriously. And basically, uh, you know, his theory became very popular uh, in Europe, not so much in the United States. So you see, this is a 100 francs 
note that before the euro was put forward, and they even put his picture here, you see, on this note. Um, but uh, let me just say a few words about this theory, which I will not go into too many details, but the idea is that you want to treat uh, the propagation of Green's functions uh, as, as non-local, but the scattering processes or the self-energy as local. And, and, and in this approach, the calculations can be uh, simplified to a, to a large degree, and such that you can go into the regime which is far from the normal Fermi liquid regime and incorporate some local processes like the polar formation. It has been mostly used for Hubbard-like models. This is not what I'll be talking about today. But it is a method that becomes, in fact, increasingly accurate when you go to lattices with high coordination numbers or high dimensions. And in this limit, you can separate effects associated with symmetry breaking and uh, orders, which we are which we're not interested in, and local processes associated with strong interactions. So, now, uh, one thing that I should say is that the reason why this hasn't been done so much is because uh, if you go to this limit of high coordination, high dimensions, then, in fact, Anderson localization goes away. And so even DMFT has been fairly useful for lattices uh, for problems with strong correlation and so forth. Uh, uh, for Anderson localization, that has been not used too much because in the strict limit of infinite dimension, when this approximation that Gabi put forward is exact, when Anderson localization goes away completely. And uh, one of the goals that I set to for myself is to try to bring in Anderson localization in this local picture and ask a question, uh, can I distinguish a metal and an insulator by looking at local quantities, and then I can compute these local quantities in some self-consistent fashion. And in fact, uh, the idea how to do this has been forward, in fact, in the original paper by Phil Anderson, 1958, uh, because in that paper, he, in fact, took the local point of view. He said, if I look at a particle, a local density of states of a particle or on, a, on a lattice, then if I look at a metal, it's a band of uh, excitations, and uh, then the Fermi Golden Rule tells us that we can escape to a neighborhood proportional to density of states. But if my neighborhood has bound states, then there will be the, the local density of states will have just delta function peaks, and maybe at the Fermi energy, there will be no state in which you can escape. Okay? And this, so, so at the local density of states at one particular site, not the average value, but the non average value can distinguish between, not only between uh, a band insulator and a metal, but also between an Anderson insulator and a metal. Now, of course, if you look at different sites, then these delta function peaks, bound state positions, will be random. So if you average over the entire sample, this information will be lost. But if you look at a particular uh, site, you can tell the local density of states can tell you uh, whether it's an insulator or a metal. And of course, this uh, is not news to anyone who has seen these beautiful experiments by Ali Azdani. Previous speakers show the same picture. Today with STM, we can look at it. And in fact, you see the local density of states is uh, just proportional to the wave function amplitude. So when we have bound states, then, uh, then the local density of states has these bumps, and you can really basically uh, observe in an experiment how this works. And so uh, this is actually the result of a numerical calculation that illustrates the principle. I looked, uh, here are the results on one site, and then uh, uh, as we crank up this order, let's see how the spectrum on that one site changes, and it goes from a band to uh, bound states, but on the barely on the metallic side, you have these broadened uh, uh, delta function peaks, and the typical width of these peaks is basically telling you the lifetime for escaping from the site. So this is a local view which has been put forward in 1958. And the only question is now, uh, if we want to distinguish an Anderson insulator and a metal, we have to compute this broadening parameter of this peak or its typical value. And this is what, uh, oops. This is what uh, we have done in, in this uh, paper in 19. Uh, in 2003 with my first graduate student uh, when I came to Florida. Uh, let me just first give you some results. Uh, so here is the phase diagram. If you crank up disorder, not interacting other solar causation, here's the band. There's a gap. There's a band of states. Crank up disorder. And then the band broadens. But here you have Anderson localized states. And here you have ex still extended states. There are band tails are getting localized. Then the whole band localizes. But uh, to distinguish these phases, in addition to a diffusion constant or conductivity, you can also look at the local spectrum. Because you've seen that on the previous picture, 
the local density of states is here, here, is very high, very occasionally, and most of the time is very low. So the distribution function for the local density of states is sharply picked at a typical value which is much smaller than the average value. And then this typical value vanishes, that indicates a localization. So you can try to parameterize the typical value uh, in different ways. In fact, this result is known, also confirmed by numerics and by the 2 plus epsilon expansion uh, uh, in, in weak localization. Uh, but uh, as it happens, this typical value, which we propose serves as an order parameter, in fact, well represented by the so-called geometric average. And generally in statistics, if we have uh, something with broad distributions, the uh, most probable value is well represented by this geometric average, where we have to average the log and then put that in the exponent. And it is known that this quantity, in fact, vanishes at the Adamson transition with some exponent beta. That has been calculated numerically. So uh, you, here is the result of this numerical calculation. Here is the average density of states, which doesn't vanish. And this geometric average does vanish here at the Anderson transition. So our idea was to, uh, to try to compute this uh, geometrically average local density of states as an order parameter. And we implemented this in, uh, in, uh, in the form of these equations. I'm not going to go into details. But uh, the important thing is that this is a very local perspective where we can introduce a certain self-energy Sigma, which describes this typical medium in which you are embedding the site, which is different than the average medium. So uh, if you replace a, a geometric average by the algebraic average, you will just recover the so-called coherent potential approximation, which misses under soil localization. And it does so because uh, it computes a quantity that, that is not critical. So here is, in fact, in this paper, we've done uh, calculations for a 3D under soil localization model, large-scale numerics, Vladislav Nikolic did this, and this is the average density of states. The dashed line is the analytical calculation, and this is our theory. The dots are the, uh, the results of the numerical calculation. So you see the uh, transition is a little bit off, uh, and the critical exponent is not exactly correct, but this is not surprising. This is a kind of mean field treatment that uh, this is the best you can expect. But you can see that quantitative agreement is reasonable. Uh, you can think of this as an equivalent of a Brackley's theory for localization. Uh, I should also say that before I go on to Polaron's story, uh, that uh, uh, this, theory, this theory doesn't become exact in infinite dimensions. It's never really exact. And this sheds doubt on, uh, is it, does it make sense at all? Uh, this issue has been addressed when my former student, Tanya Teletska, went to work at Louisiana State and Mark Gerald, who developed the so-called DCA cluster theories within the MFT. He, uh, he wanted to use this DCA cluster approach in this type framework, and they've done so. There is a series of papers. I was involved at the, at the beginning of my first paper, but later they, they extended this to many models, and they've done pretty large clusters. And you can see, in fact, that, uh, that this method, is, as soon as you make the clusters a little bigger, the, uh, the, the phase diagram and so forth can be calculated reasonably accurately. And so there is a rather good convergence uh, when you look at cluster generalizations of this method. So this is not a good way to compute a critical exponent, but if you want phase diagrams and the whole phase, you know, phase diagram and, and so forth, that's a pretty reasonable and accurate method. Now, uh, to address the, the question that I started to discuss, which is what happens when we add phonons, the formable lattice. Uh, so this was done in this paper published last year in PRL. Uh, we took the simplest Holstein model where in addition to kinetic energy and disorder, uh, there is an electron phonon coupling, which we are coupling the electrons to local phonons for simplicity. Now you may wonder, well, wh why local phonons? We were interested in relatively high temperature transport where the, uh, we got linear resistivity that's above the Debye temperature. When, and this regime, you know, giving you the textbook linear resistivity, this is where the dispersion of phonons uh, it can be ignored. So, so uh, this is sufficient if you're interested in this high temperature regime. Uh, I, I should say that, uh, in fact, uh, uh, this problem is characterized by this coupling constant lambda, which is basically the ratio of the potential energy that you gain if you uh, deform the lattice, uh, and the kinetic energy or the Fermi energy. And here, the potential energy is just given by g squared over omega zero, where uh, Omega zero is the, uh, is the frequency of the Einstein mode and the coupling constant. So this is basically measures, you know, how much potential energy you gain uh, with deformations. Uh, 
Okay, so here are our main results, and I'll spend. I didn't want to. I wanted to give you uh, the, uh, the background of what we've done and explain the setting in, in great detail as I've done so far. Uh, I didn't want to go into too many details and equations about this specific calculation here, which you can find in the paper. I'm happy to discuss with anyone in, 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 pr in private. Uh, there are a lot of details that I'll skip, but I want to emphasize some, some of the, our main results. So you see this model, uh, here is the disorder, and here is the electron phonon coupling constant. So um, if you have no disorder and you take a metal, uh, you can, in fact, crank up the electron phonon interaction to be, uh, to be so strong that you can uh, open a gap due to self-trapping of polarons, even at finite density. But uh, typically, uh, the electron phonon coupling constant you need for this uh, is uh, large, uh, you, you know, it has to be very large of order one. And no metal on this planet has such a large electron phonon coupling constant. So the polarons in metals at finite densities, they don't exist. So you may wonder, this picture of Anderson, does it have any relevance or not? What we found in this, in this calculation is uh, as you crank up disorder and as you approach this Anderson transition or what would be the Anderson transition before we turn on the electron phonon coupling, then uh, the electron become less and less mobile. And I mentioned to you that uh, uh, the, the uh, coupling constant in measures basically it compares potential energy and kinetic energy, but as you are making the electrons less mobile due to scattering and eventual formation of bound states, the typical kinetic energy or mobility of the electron goes down. So you would expect that then the effect of electron phonon coupling uh, becomes enhanced. And this is exactly what we find in this calculation. So uh, in the clean model, there is something that you may call the polaron transition. And this is when you know, this coordinate of the Einstein, in the Einstein model, uh, there is a coordinate which describes how you deform the lattice. And the average value of this coordinate in a metal will be zero. And then when you open a gap and you form these self-trapped polarons, then this coordinate becomes finite. So when the polaron transition means that you are now developing static polarons and that you are opening the gap. So you're deforming the lattice rather than lattice just vibrating. The average value of the phonon coordinate suddenly becomes finite. So that's called the polaron transition. And what we find in this calculation is that uh, here is the our order parameter, which we computed through this typical medium theory. And we find that generically, as we turn on electron phonon coupling, which is given by these different lines, these are different strengths of the electron phonon coupling. Every time before we reach this, uh, uh, this Anderson transition or the metal insular transition here, well, then the polar transition happens before that. So even though at weak disorder, these, these polarons they didn't do almost anything. But as we crank up the, uh, uh, the disorder, then uh, basically this turns on the electron phonon coupling constant. It becomes very strong, such that the polaronic uh, displacement become, uh, become manifest close to the transition. And in fact, this polaron transition happens. There is a line that I didn't draw here that happens here uh, just before the metal insular transition. So this means that these polaronic effects are very important. And in fact, they become important not only deep on this one inside, but in fact, they actually drive the transition and you can see this here that uh, I started with a question, do the disorder interactions help each other or not? Yes, they do here. Uh, you see that the critical disorder that you need uh, to go through the metal insular transition, as you crank up the electron phonon coupling, this starts to come down rapidly. So this means that the disorder is helping the lattice deform itself and the lattice deformations, they are then uh, in fact increasing the amplitude of the random potential and creating self-trapping. And as we go through the transition, the electron uh, the dominant mechanism is not necessarily interference, but in fact is the, uh, the self-trapping, which is enhanced by disorder. And you can see this, that in fact, uh, uh, this is the typical density of states shown here in blue. Uh, the states, so when this is zero, that means you, you hit the localization. So you ask, which states localize first, the band edge or the band center? And uh, in the non-interacting localization, always band edge is localized first. But here we find that the center of the band localizes first. And that's because this is where the electron phonon interaction is most prominent. And in fact, you find, just like Anderson predicted, when you look at the renormalized uh, disorder due to the lattice deformation, disorder distribution.
which people you see that it will open a gap as before the transition is hit so there is a mechanism for opening these gaps and this is apparently in this model at least in this model calculation is a driving force for the transition which in some sense overwhelms and the solar causation it's assisted solar causation but it becomes a, a dominant effect now bef uh, but before we hit the transition uh, here is the uh, this uh, the line here uh, separates the good metal from the so-called you may call it the bad metal but this is where we hit the so-called mod limit and that's where the resistivity is flat with temperature and this is shown better over here so so this is you see this is the experiment that I showed you by Dines and I've shown you that there are 500 other materials where this has been observed with this systematic correlation between slope and intercept so there is some universal behavior which is very well documented and in our theory we find the same behavior you see curves uh, this is conductivity these are metallic curves it goes up these are insulating curves there is an insulator here the conductivity drops to zero exponentially there is one uh, at the critical point the conductivity goes to zero in a power fashion as we expect we can find scaling quantum critical scaling around this red line the transition but there is a different uh, characteristic disorder here where we find the flat curve and where is this flat curve and it's precisely at the mod limit so uh, what we and so you see this gray area shaded here indicates uh, this is conductivity shown in the units of the mod limit where you set the mean free path to one all the experimental data you can uh, you know what is the density of carriers etc you can estimate where is the mod limit and you find that uh, this is the shaded area here where the experiment all the experiments are found and this is what we found in our theory so you see it seems that uh, something dramatic happens as we get to the mod limit and what we found is actually I don't have uh, time to go into details so I'm happy to explain in private and we have actually another preprint now in the archive giving details of this you can do a low temperature uh, a, a low temperature approximation to these equations and do this analytically and you find that the slope uh, of the resistivity which is which is given by the phonon in elastic scattering that prefactor this is disorder dependent and in fact goes to uh, to zero precisely at the mod limit but this is away from the critical region here so uh, this is the if we take the lambda to be 0.3 which is a reasonable value for metals then uh, we can get a very good quantitative fit with the Dines, for example, experiment. And in our paper, you can see in our preprint that we have been able to collapse data from 500 experiments in a universal way. So this basically says that, and so what happens at that point is that the distribution or the was it starts to open. So basically, this polaronic effect that is developed on the insulating side, it kicks in and it becomes significant when you hit the mod limit precisely and so that's basically the reason why this happens in at least in our theory in our view is that this is that is where the uh, uh, polaronic effects are basically revealed because the mobility of electrons is is low enough so that so that the lattice deformations can strongly enhance the effects of disorder so this is pretty much what what i wanted to say i would like to make just a few comments at the end um, what is actually even more remarkable, and I didn't want to write anything on the transparencies, but let me say it in words. You may ask this question, is Anderson localization important at all in this, at least in this regime? And to answer this question, you can replace this typical medium theory, which can capture, as you have seen, it captures Anderson localization rather quantitatively, but we can replace the geometric average by algebraic average. Then, uh, then you do not get an Anderson transition, uh, in absence of a disorder but what we found in our calculation is that once the electron fall interaction is turned in even within the CP approximation which parenthetically this theory that I'm now describing becomes exact in the limit of infinite dimensions uh, so I'm turning off localization completely but this polaronic mechanism which opens the gap survives so it shows you that this is a more robust physical mechanism that can drive the metal and transition and this is a mean field theory or settle point which is exactly in infinite dimensions which can give you a disorder driven transition not in the non interacting case the moment of interactions here is a mechanism that you can start with and I would like to mention that this is actually to me opens a huge avenue because one of the technical problems of 
uh, and the solar causation. And also true for Finkelstein type of theories is that uh, if you if you formulate the problem in a functional integral way, like we learned from Wilson and Fisher, the saddle point usually gives you mean field theory. Then you do corrections to this and do power counting and, and so forth, develop RG. Uh, the problem was that for any solar localization, that settled point did not have a transition. You had to go to one loop or more to get the transition itself. And this created a lot of technical problems and apparently it's consistent with the fact also that uh, there is no upper critical dimension for under solar localization, which is now known uh, to be an exact statement. So this problem of Anderson transition is very different. It has this multifractality, no upper critical dimension. It is a strange problem, but very possibly, when we turn on interactions, all this strangeness becomes irrelevant and will go away. This may open a technical way how to treat the metal insulator transition in a Wilsonian fashion, and I think that's an exciting step forward. Okay, Thanks. thank you, Vlad. <laughs> Questions? No, no, the mod, uh, you know, the, this region, the mod limit is not the metal insular transition. Metal insular transition is here. So this intermediate region, as you can see also here in the experiment, the, con the resistivity goes up, but it's finite at low temperature. So this is not an insulator. This is just a metal with strange temperature dependence. No, I understand. So, so but, but then at some point, there is a actual gap opening. Yes. Uh, that gap opening has a, has a uh, in this example, has a, is that, a critical disorder amount? In, in this approximation, the gap opens exactly at the critical point. Now, whether this is actually true exactly or not, uh, in a better approximation, that I'm not 100% sure. But what I know, for example, from 2 plus epsilon, within Finkelstein theory, that density of states actually goes to zero uh, at the, in the in really robustly in the, insu in the in insulator. So I believe that this is, in fact, true, that the insulator always has a vanishing density of states in a disordered uh, way. Right. So in that sense, wouldn't one would like to define a true metal insulation transition as the point when you start to see the exponential well, uh, yeah, that's, behavior? Well, yeah, that's how we define that's At, how, at the yeah. infinitesimal amount of the gap, right? So that's, yes, like yes, no, that's correct. That's correct. And this is what we also find in this theory. All right. Okay. At the risk of making this more baroque uh, or completely rococo, if if you uh, it, can, you also understand sort of how this phase diagram works together with a superconducting insulator transition. So if you use uh, the same phonons to make pairs, and then in principle, um, uh, well, you know, this, this is particularly. I think, in te te you know, uh, literally speaking, we could extend this theory to introduce pairing. Whether this will capture all the interesting effects of the interplay of disorder and superconductivity, that I'm not really sure about because we, we've seen from beautiful work that Amit showed us and earlier work by Nandini and her group that, uh, in fact, there is a form of phase separation that happens uh, at strong disorder in a, supercon in a disorder superconductor, and that's a rather subtle effect. So I'm not so sure if all these subtleties, which are specific to the superconductor, can be captured in such a simple picture as this one, but definitely, you know, some trends of this type probably can be captured, I, I assume. Of course, we have not, uh, you know, done this yet, but yeah, I think that's an interesting direction to think about, yeah. Okay, more questions? Oscar, you can start with your voice and I'll get there. Yeah, I mean, we didn't, you know, we, uh, of course, you know, we didn't, uh, we did not look for superconductivity here. You're absolutely right. Uh, of course, there are many metals which are not superconducting. So, you know, uh, I, I think that this is not really directly connected to this issue that I'm discussing here. I, I think you're right. The model that you have should have yeah, no, I mean, this is, this is true, you know, but in some sense, you know, this is, this is a unrelated process and mechanism to what I'm discussing here, you know, this is a question you can ask about any, about any metal. Yes, internal electron fold interaction is always finite and there is always, so you say, oh, it's always superconducting. It could be superconducting at some absolutely low temperature or, so, I mean, you know, that's the usual answer, right? What can I say? I don't think that's of much relevance for this regime that I'm describing here. 
But you know, but which could be po possibly interesting. Maybe, maybe this, um, when you go to stronger disorder, that could maybe, e even supercognitive, this may be relevant. Maybe some people, like uh, Pagelman and Yoffe, they believe that disorder can enhance the tendency for superconductivity or Anderson localization with this multifractal. I, I think, I personally think that's, that this is total nonsense. But, uh, but yeah, you know. Okay. Just a very quick follow-up. Do you have anomalous parts to your self-energy contained in your in your self-consistency piece no, at all? No, no. I mean, no. I mean, this is I'm not looking quite. at. The, I'm so not looking for. Yeah. You know. So therefore, at the moment, within the yeah, seal you have, it's, it's just not there. No, of course, you know, uh, as you have heard from Marcello, etc. In this framework, which is DMFT-like, you can search for superconductivity, and he has found it. So you know, uh, it's just like you, I didn't look for magnetically ordered state or some other ordered states. We could look for it. Uh, you know, this is not, uh, I mean, what we are trying to answer here is uh, what can happen in the absence of symmetry breaking? When we have symmetry breaking, we know s more, right? Th the big open question was what happens without symmetry breaking, you know, uh, and then we cannot use the thinking that Landau taught us, so. Okay, so let's thank uh, Vlad again. And we're supposed to be back here at 3.40. Do we keep that? Okay, 3.40 then.